if you're fine just covering displacement. Displacement just a little bit different than volume, but not really much. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the first one. Um, you know, it's a rectangular fish tank, basically. See how good my drawing skills are here. And currently has a water level right there. The dotted mm -hmm. line doesn't mean it's invisible, but it means that's where the water is currently resting. And we know that the base is 15 by 15. We're not given what the height is. Okay, let me just make sure that I'm... A rock is added, and it raises the water level 3 centimeters. If the container is a rectangular prism, what is the volume of the rock? Okay, if yeah. we drop any object whatsoever, whether it's a rock or a balloon or a piece of foam, as long as it completely displaces the water, then the volume of that object can be measured by the amount of water that gets displaced. Okay. okay. What they're telling us here is that if we drop a rock into this fish tank, it's going to raise the level by three centimeters. So if I want to know the volume of that water that got raised, what is that volume? Uh Based on site. Volume is always three dimensions. Okay. It's, in other words, if I say what's the volume of a rectangular prism, it's the base, well, it's the width times the length times the height. If I knew that this fish tank was 20 centimeters high, then I would know the volume of the fish tank. I still wouldn't know where the volume of that water is, but they didn't give us that. Okay, what I want is the volume of this sliver of water that is three centimeters high. Well, that's its own rectangular prism all on its own. What is that volume of that little sliver of that rectangular prism? 15 by 15 by 4 or 3. By, by 3, exactly. And that's the way you want to do all of these displacement problems. They could be done a different way. They could be done as subtraction problems. In other words, finding the volume of the full water and then subtracting out the volume of the water before you added the rock. But that's actually a harder way to do it. This is a bit like a shaded region problem, only when applied to three dimensions, not two dimensions. Okay? Next question is very similar, only it's a cylinder. And the cylinder, when you drop a solid piece of glass, I think, metal, it doesn't really matter, a solid glass ball, and the cylinder has a radius of 6. So from here to here is 6. And there was some level that the water was at before you drop the glass ball into it. And after you drop the glass ball into it, it raised it by one centimeter. So that distance is one. Okay. So what we have to calculate is the volume of that water. Because that volume of that water that got displaced is exactly the same as the volume of the 
solid glass ball, regardless of what shape mm -hmm. the ball is. The ball could actually be rectangular, could be triangular, could be circular. It doesn't matter. It's going to displace as long as it goes completely under the water. You can imagine that the amount of water that gets displaced is the exact volume of whatever went into it. So how do I get the measurement if I draw the back side of that? That is a little band of water, right? Yeah. Only it actually fills the whole cylinder. So what's the volume of this narrow strip? Pi 6 squared times 1. Very good. So 36 pi. Another fish tank, only this time they kind of try to fool you a little bit by giving you a dimension that is not needed. Here's our fish tank. It's 10 inches by 14 right. inches by 12 inches high. So that's 10, that's 14, and that's 12. This time there's a goldfish that lives in there. And when you take the goldfish out of the water, it drops by a third of an inch. In other words, the water oh, yeah. level was right there. And now the new water level is right there. So what is the volume of that layer of water? Um, uh, 10 by 14 by one third. Very good. Notice that this measurement they gave you of 12 was completely unneeded. It only served to complicate the issue because we have to know what the width is and what the depth is. That's what's important to us. The height of the fish tank really doesn't matter. As long as we know that that measurement is one-third, then you hit it. 10 by 14 by one-third. All right, now they get a little tougher, but not, not so much. I'm going to leave my picture the same, only change the dimensions. Hold on a second. Let's, let's erase that. Let's erase that. Let's erase that. Let's erase that. And what are they telling us? They're telling us that the ice chest measures 35 by 50 by 30 high. And the only thing, in other words, again, that 30 is not really going to affect things. Okay? Now, yeah. this time, when they drop in an ice cube or a piece of ice, it doesn't get totally submerged because ice floats on water. But the sentence tells you that one-eighth of the volume floats above the water, seven-eighths floats below the water. What's the complete volume of the ice? Well, first of all, what happens? When we drop the ice in, raises the water level by four inches. So that measurement is four. So what's the amount of displacement? Four inches, four cubic centimeters. Volume-wise, how much water got displaced? Four centimeters cubed. No. What's the volume of that rectangular prism worth of water there? Uh, 35 by 50 by 4. Okay, that's 7,000. 
cubic centimeter. But how much of the ice displaced that? Uh, seven eighths of it. Okay, so let's write an equation. Seven eighths of the volume of the ice block equals 7,000. In other words, the entire block of ice did not displace 7,000 cubic centimeters of water. Seven-eighths of it did. Because only oh, yeah. seven-eighths of the volume of that ice is below the water. The other eighth of it is floating on top. So the only part that displaced water was the seven-eighths of the ice that is below the top of the water level. So if I knew the full volume of the ice block, I know that 7 eighths of it is equal to 7,000, right? Yeah. What's that make the volume of the ice? 8,000. Correct. So the volume of the ice is 8,000. In other words, if I were to push on top of that floating ice cube, until the very top of it was level with the, the layer of the water, then the entire ice block would be submerged. Oh, yeah. and it would displace 8,000 cubic centimeters of water, not 7. The only reason it only displaces 7 is because only 7 eighths of the ice block is below the water. Oh, yeah. The last one on this page is quite similar to that one, only it's a cylindrical container. That has a radius of five, has a water level right there. And when a piece of wood, half of which is floating in the water, half of which is not, raises the water level by three centimeters, what's the volume of the entire piece of wood? How much volume got displaced? Um, five, cube, 5 cubed plus times 3. 5 squared. Yeah. In other words, volume of a cylinder is the area of the base, pi r squared, times the height. So this gives you a volume that's in cubic something. Because height, oh, yeah. is in, height is in centimeters and radius is in centimeters. So when I square that and multiply it by height, I get cubic. But it's important to recognize that the uh, volume of a cylinder is the area of its circular base times its height. So how much water got displaced when the, this piece of wood, half of it got submerged? Um. Can you say that again? Yeah. How much is this volume right there of the water? Uh, 75. Pi. Yeah. Cubic centimeters. Okay. That got displaced by half of that piece of wood. What's the volume of the piece of wood? Um... 1.5 times 75. 2 times 75. In other words, what we have is the volume of the wood, one half of it, was equal to 75 pi. Okay. Because only half of it's underneath the water. The, the, the half of it that's floating above the water is not displacing any water at all. So 
So okay. what's the volume of the wood? Um, 150 pi. 150 pi, exactly. So on all floating objects, this is actually easier than the previous one because one half, you know, is easier to work with than seven eighths. Um, but you always end up multiplying the amount of water that got displaced by the reciprocal of how what percentage is floating under the water or what percentage is under the water and not floating above it. If, um, if three-fourths yeah. was under the water, then I would multiply this number by four-thirds to find out the volume of the wood. It's always the reciprocal of the fraction that is underneath the water. All right. Uh, well, you made pretty good quick work of that. Um, just to, I don't have the problems on the other side of this. Uh, I, I've got some other problems we can look at, but for the, you know the next ten minutes. But notice yeah. what density is. Density okay. is weight per volume. So the densest thing on here is platinum. More dense than lead, twice as dense. Platinum basically weighs 21 grams per cubic one centimeter. So the more dense something is, the more weight a given amount of volume of it is. So whenever, you, whenever you're given a problem about density, well, your first step is always going to be to calculate the volume of that object. And however many cubic centimeters you have of it, multiply it by its weight, and that's the total weight. In other words, if you had 10 cubic centimeters of silver, how much would it weigh? Um, a hundred, one, one hundred. One hundred and five. That's right. Yeah. One hundred and, just move the decimal point over one spot when you're multiplying by ten. Interesting here. I really had no idea that gold was twice as dense as lead. I would have said the other way around. I thought lead was one of the densest materials there is. That's why lead is such a good protector against uh, radioactivity is because it's so dense. The radioactive waves can't get through it. All right. Um, let's see. What do we want to do the last few minutes? You want to do surface areas or volumes of solids? Both are extremely uh. important. We try surface areas. Yeah, surface areas of polygons. Let's just do one or two of these at random. No, we'll do the hard one. 14. Surface areas are harder than volumes. Volumes, you got a volume formula, you plug it in. Surface areas tend to be a little different. Solve for the surface area of the right prism. Round off your answer. Well, we don't need to do that. But let's first of all figure out what the surface area is going to be of that number 14. What's the general formula? Um, surface area equals now this base times height. This is a tough one. Any prism is always capital base times height. But it makes me nervous when you say base times height because I have no way of distinguishing that base from a linear base. If I gave you a rectangle and said what's the area of this rectangle it would be base times height, okay? okay. But this little b is measured in linear units. That's 10 meters or 10 inches or whatever. Whereas when we're talking surface area 
we're talking the area base, capital B, which means the base of an area. The dimensions on capital B are going to be square meters, the same as the dimensions on surface area. Okay, but if, it, if we wanted volume, it would be the area of the base times the height, x. Okay? But we don't want volume. We want surface area. Well, that's 2 times b, the area of the circular base and the circular top, plus the lateral area. And this is the tough one to remember the lateral area. Well, let's start with capital B. What's capital B? What's the formula for capital B? The general formula? Uh, eight, pi 8.2 squared. <laughs> pi r squared. We'll fill in the 8.2 later. So there's capital B and there's two of them, a the top and a bottom. So the only thing else we have is this lateral area that goes around the middle. How do I get oh, yeah. that? How do I get that? Um, you remember? Think of a soup can and a label. If you unwrapped the label of a soup can, it would have this shape. Yeah. Right? Be rectangular. Yeah. Well, this is X. That's the height. What is, um, what is this distance right here? This is the thing that most everybody has the hardest time with. So uh, 8.2. What does that distance represent? Think about the label on a soup can. If you wrap the label around a soup can and it exactly matches. In other words, there's no overlap. This edge lines up perfectly with this edge after you wrap it around. Circumference. Ah, so what's the circumference? The general equation. I don't remember. 2 pi r. Okay. Remember it's got the same three numbers in it as the area, pi r squared. If there's two formulas, you always want to know it's area of a circle and circumference of a circle. Okay? So that lateral area is 2 pi r, the circumference, times x. Okay? Now, that's everything there is for the entire surface area of that. Well, they gave us the surface area, so let's plug that in for SA. And they gave us the radius, 2 times pi times 8.2 squared, plus 2 times pi times 8.2, not squared, just 8.2, times x. There is only one variable in that equation. That's x. So you can solve for it. Okay. Okay. Uh, all of these come down to an equation, ends up having one variable in it, and you need to be good at algebra. Let's just make sure that you don't have any problems with the algebra here. Um... Let me figure out what 8.2 squared is. 8.2 times 8.2 equals 8.2 times 8.2 equals 67.24. So we have 2 pi times 67.24 plus 2 pi times 8.2 x equals 1,097. What's the next step okay. I'm going to do? Um, 
I'm you trying to decide to solve. Solve. I'm trying to solve yeah. for x. So when I've got a variable on one side of the equation, I got a bunch of other stuff with it. We got to get rid of it. How do we get rid of this? Get rid of that first. Uh, you could subtract it. Okay. So on the left side of the equation, I got 1097 minus 2 pi times 67.24. That gets rid of that. And now how do I get rid of the other thing that's multiplying x? Divide. Okay. So I'm going to divide the left side by 2 pi, the whole thing, times 8.2. And that's equal to x. Okay. And everything on the left side is a number. Now, be careful about one thing here, and that's round off error. If they insist that you convert these to decimals, like this question did, round your answer to two decimals, don't round off until you get to the end. When I did it on my calculator and I squared 8.2, well, I, I, there was no round off error. It was 67.24. But had there been extra decimals there, I wouldn't have wanted to round it off that quickly. Carry it out to three or maybe four decimals if you want to make sure your final answer does not have round off error. Okay. Okay. All right, Mark, I will let you go. When is your quiz? Uh, Friday. Friday? That's... What is today? Today is Tuesday? Oh, okay. So we'll have a session before your quiz. You should have some, re yeah. you should have some review material for that, I would think. Yeah. Okay. Send it to me and work on that on, on Thursday. All right, Mark. Yeah. Talk to you Thursday. All right, see you, dude.